Welcome back to the Legacy Project, part two, session two, in relation to spirits on assignment. You know, the first session we talked about how a familiar spirit, you know, a spirit that, that wants to suck up to you but really destroy you, even sometimes our close friends, our family. Uh, and as I said, we certainly don't want a martyrdom complex. We don't want to walk around suspicious of people. But not everybody is for you. And not everybody is for you, particularly when you come into blessing or about to be blessed, have a dream. And uh, just like Joseph brothers, they, they wanted to destroy him. And, and so often, you know, those close to us, and we saw it with Judas, with Jesus and so forth. And I'd love you to go back over session one if you missed it. Today, we're going to be talking about the Luciferian spirit, the Luciferian spirit, these spirits on assignment that are out to destroy us because we live in a very spiritual world. And so when you think about the devil, of course, his name was Lucifer. His name is also Satan. His name is also the accuser of the brethren. And that's why we ought not to do the devil's work and accuse the brethren. Uh, so many Christians go around accusing others and that's the work of the devil, not the work of God. He's also called the Lord of the flies. Wow. I mean, think about flies hanging around, you know, a dead thing. He's called the destroyer. Hello. So we know he's out to rob, kill and destroy. He's called the great dragon and the prince of the ear. And so when you think about the devil, you know, Satan was once in the throne room of God. And you think about Lucifer, you know, you think about the star of the morning, you know, um, playing music in heaven. Pride, of course, entered his heart. Pride is a horrendous thing. Take the best people out. And uh, he got cast out of heaven. But we see in the book of Job, he wanders in. He had access to the throne of God. It's something like, well, you know, and uh, he would have been and got so familiar with the anointing of God when he was a worshiper with God and familiarity can breed contempt. We see this in the world today. Of course, we see it with families, how familiarity can breed contempt. Jesus, of course, his own brothers. Uh, and, 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 and as I said, if this happened to Jesus, a tall poppy syndrome and, and people stabbing him in the back and, you know, even Peter, the disciple saying to Jesus, uh, you know, um, don't do this, don't go to Jerusalem. And Jesus had to say to Peter, get behind me, Satan. If this can happen to Jesus, they put him on a cross, then it can happen to us, of course. And, and here was the devil. And he was, uh, I guess, so familiar with the throne room, with the anointing of God. Basically, he lost respect for it. And uh, Jesus' own brothers, it says, did not believe in him until Jesus was resurrected from the dead. And then they did. But, you know, just growing up. And did not Jesus say that a prophet in his own hometown has no honor as well? Again, there's familiarity. And so the devil, I don't know exactly what went on when he was a worshiper in heaven, the music maker in heaven, but obviously pride entered his heart. We know that. But he obviously lost respect. He lost uh, the gratitude for the anointing of God. He lost his awe, his fear of God. And uh, he thought he could be better than God. Wow. You know, it's amazing in the church. So many people think they can be better than the pastor. Maybe they think they can, but it's a wrong spirit. And so the thing is, is that, um, you know, the devil thought he could be better than God. He thought he could be higher than God. And he had access like no others. And so he was so familiar with the anointing and so familiar with the, the presence of God, he lost respect for it. You know, when we come into the house of God, uh, week after week, year after year. I want to encourage you, no matter how uh, old you are in the Lord, never to lose the passion and the humility and the fear of the Lord in the house of the Lord, right? Um, you know, when you first become saved, everything is wonderful. And, you know, just being in church, wow. But it's so easy. I've seen it. People become familiar with it and they lose that, that hunger. They lose that desire. They lose that passion and uh, lose that respect for it. And uh, it's just like in my life, you know, people, you know, when they first come in, it's, you know, Pastor Peter, and I don't want to be put on a pedestal, no way, but I understand honour and I understand the principle of pastoralship and, and so forth, so forth. But after a while, you know, oh, it's just old Peter, what does he know, you know? And so people become familiar with you and uh, familiarity breeds contempt. So Proverbs says this, we need to guard our hearts with all diligence because out of it flows the springs of life. And spiritual things matter. They do matter. And it's a dangerous thing to be used so familiar to the anointing, to get so used to the uh, anointing that we become just familiar with it. We always need to be 
I believe in awe of God and so grateful for the presence of God. And so to be so close to an anointed ministry, we can take it for granted. And, you know, where once we, you know, I see it particularly with young people, but everybody, you know, a guest speaker comes into the church and people are like, oh, you know. Now, again, we've got to guard against uh, stardomship. We've got to guard against idolizing people. We can be just as bad as the world. The church can be just as bad as the world. Uh, they've got their rock stars and movie stars and we can have our Christian stars. And I'm not talking about that. There's a difference between that and honor. We do need to honor. We need to value people. That's what honor is, right? Value the gifting on their life. Value them. And we need to honor all people, all people, one another. And uh, so the thing is often because we don't know that guest speaker, we don't know them, we're not familiar with them, uh, we can hold them up as, you know, some saviour, you know, and we just want them to pray for us. And, you know, where it's just one of the normal ministry in the church, so we think, ah, oh, it's just, it's just whether I'll pick on myself, ah, oh, it's just Peter again, you know, or one of the other campus pastors and whatever. And not only... Do they often want to, you know, these these spirits, uh, this Luciferian spirit want to pull you down to their level. They often think that they are better than you and they think they know more and uh, you no longer, uh, you know, uh, they no longer want to have that honour in their life. They no want to have no respect in their life. They just want to bring everything down. And so they see your faults. And as I said, everybody's got faults. I'm probably one of those pastors that share my faults with people. I often have to apologize apologize for the things I do. I understand my feet of clay. I'm saved by grace. I'm just another person just like everybody else. But I also understand and appreciate the gift on my life, the anointing on my life and so forth. But often all people can see is your faults and you, and your humanity. And, uh, you know, the thing is, is that the Lord continually and constantly shows his goodness and his grace and his mercy. And the Bible says that he's slow to anger. But if you push on the grace of God and take the goodness of God for granted, we run the danger of seeing the other side of God um, manifest. And, and the Bible says, behold, the goodness and the severity of God. The Bible talks about that, hey, God broke off, you know, the, 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 the branch, Israel, that we may be grafted in. But then it says, hey, you, you make sure you stay humble and grateful because if God broke them off, he can break you off as well. And so, you know, some people, even in the grace of God and the love of God, they think they're beyond, um, you know, the severity of God, but we're not. There's, there's that balance, and I, I don't know about you, but, you know, we got to walk that balance and understand it and, and share that. And uh, behold the goodness. He is a good God, and I praise God for that. But, you know, there is also the other side that we need to understand and hold the fear of God. And people don't like talking about the fear of God because they think that, you know, it just conjures up God up there with a big stick, uh, whacking you every time you do something wrong. And that's not what to I'm talking about. But I'm talking about holding God with respect, holding God with honor, not just, you know, not treating him. You know, some people think he's their long lost buddy. They walk into church chewing gum late. They don't care. We need to walk into church or come before God, you know, with thanksgiving in our heart, enter his courts with praise, you know. And I know he's our friend. Hallelujah. But, you know, sometimes we want to bring God down to our own level and bring God down, you know, so that he's that he's just our, you know, and even some terms we use are so familiar. I mean, we, we've got to hold God in an awe and a respect. He's worthy of it all. Um, so in any case. Uh, people with a, a Luciferian spirit operate in, in their lives. Uh, often they see their role to keep leadership humble, you know, to keep leadership humble. You know, there's an old saying, Lord, you keep the ministry poor, we'll keep them humble, you know. And um, as, as, it's not your role to keep leadership humble. God, the Bible says, hey, uh, humble yourself under the pre presence of God and he will exalt you in due time. But if we exalt Him, ex exalt ourselves, he will humble us. It's God's job to humble us, not our job to humble each other, right? Uh, but this Luciferian spirit doesn't like to be under authority. It hates authority. It always wants to rise above. That's what Lucifer wanted to do. They th he thought he was better than God. He said, I will ascend. I will become like God. Uh, Luciferian spirit, they always think they're right. Have you ever met people that always think they're right? Um, you know, 
<laughs> they become so dogmatic. They won't change their mind. They're not open to counsel. They're not open to even the word of God. They're not open to direction. They don't like being questioned, but they always think they're right. You know, being right is not a fruit of the spirit. Being right is not a fruit of the spirit. And so remember the scripture, rebellion is as a sin of, of witchcraft. And I know some Christians, uh, and I'm talking to Christians, uh, you know, would be horrified to think they're operating in, in, in witchcraft, but rebellion is like that when we rebel. And stubbornness, the Bible says, rebellion is as a sin of witchcraft and stubbornness as adultery, as idolatry, as not adultery, idolatry. And so you think about how, how spiritual these things are, rebellion and stubbornness. Do you know a stubborn person? They're so stubborn. They dig their toes in. They won't be taught. They just know, you know, I know some of these people and uh, you know some of these people. When the sons of God came to present themselves to the Lord, uh, to present means to come under. It means to be ready, to be inspected, to be ready for service. That's what it means. And when the sons of God came before the Lord to be ready, to be inspected, ready for service, Satan comes along. And he's basically kind of like wanting to know what everybody else has been doing. And so God says to Satan, it's an amazing uh, scripture. We're going to read it right now. But where have you been? And Satan says, well, I've been to and fro. You know, I've been hanging out. You know, have a look in Job 1 verse 6. It's uh, amazing. Now, there's a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. And Satan also came among them. And the Lord said to Satan, and where do you come from? Satan answered the Lord and said, from going to and fro on the earth and from walking back and forth on it. And so, you know, it's like a prideful answer. It was like an arrogant answer. There is no straight answer. He said, basically he said, well, I'm not accountable to, to you, you know. Uh, you're not going to nail me down. Uh, he, he's like in competition with authority. I, I, will ascend, I will be like, you know. The Luciferian spirit, Lucifer spirit, wants to be like and even better than the one they're supposed to be serving. Did you just hear what I said? The Lucifer spirit wants to be like and even better than the one they're supposed to be serving. David says this, my enemy has magnified himself. My enemy has magnified himself. And so these people like Lucifer fall out of the covenant of their heart, the covenant of their heart. They fall out of reverence for God in their heart. You think about this, you can be in church and fall out of reverence for God. I know people who've done that. Uh, and as I said, Satan was in, he was in heaven and fell out of reverence for God. So let's never get too prideful that we think it won't happen to us. Um, you know, I, I often think about Solomon and David and Peter and Judas, you know, all these people, of course, you know, at one time or another messed up and, and Peter denied Jesus. David went out and did these things and, and Solomon and so forth and Judas and Lucifer. And uh, we need to understand if it can happen to them, it can happen to us. And so we need to walk humbly before our God. And so we're not talking about, uh, sorry, we are talking about losing respect for the anointing. We must hold the anointing with utmost respect and respect the anointing. Unfortunately, when once God spoke through, uh, you know, a person through a sermon, um, you know, now they think, oh, it's just maybe Peter prattling on again, you know. They no longer hear what God has got to say on a Sunday. Amazingly, so many people won't and even don't bother to worship God when they come along. They, they can't be bothered entering in. Uh, they're just taking it for, for granted. Uh, they, 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 they'll be quick to point out if the singing's flat, if the music's off key or too loud, they'll be critical, but they don't enter in. You know, our heart should be really, I don't care what we're singing, I just want to worship the Lord, you know. And, uh, but others who can't take an instruction from an usher, this happens in churches all the time. You know, be, you know an usher's trying to help people, uh, trying to have the church decently in order and people get all upset and who do they think they are? Don't you know how long I've been coming to church for? I always sit in that row. I uh, park my car there, you know, like maybe when a conference is on and you're asked to park somewhere else and people get all upset about it, you know. Uh, they've just become too familiar. Uh, they've got to sit in their particular seat. Uh, where once they were just happy to be in the meeting, you know, and maybe they make little jokes about the pastor or about the worship and, you know, words smooth as butter, but a sword comes down the throat, right? Dainty morsels, the Bible talks about it. 
And um, maybe they go to a conference and the guest speaker becomes their pastor now because the guest speaker sounds, you know, better or maybe they probably are. That's why they're a guest speaker, right? But, you know, next thing they're following them and not listening to their local pastor. And often I say, you know, it's not the guest speaker that's going to visit you in hospital or arrange to have one of their pastors that they've employed to visit you in hospital or, you know, is not going to be looking out for you and so forth, so forth. But often television ministries, I know people who tithe to television ministries around the world. The tithe belongs in the local church and we all need a pastor that we can, you know, you know, sit under. And often say, if you don't have a pastor, you're on your way to disaster. But so many people just want to idolize someone across the world that they'll never get to meet, that that person wouldn't know if they're dying or had a baby or whatever it is. Uh, but, you know, the local pastor, and I feel sorry for sometimes pastors of small churches where people have got so familiar with them and because uh, they get so close to them. And I know in a church our size, not everybody can get close, uh, but I, I'm, I'm very hands-on. I'll get, walk around, talk with everybody. But you get close to someone and you're going to see their weaknesses, right? It's, that's just the way it is. And we've all got weaknesses, but you don't get to see the weakness of the guy on TV. You only get to see him on a Sunday best. You don't get to see the weaknesses of a guest speaker either, often at times. And so the spirit that pulls down and works on weakness and often wants to deflate you, even steal your confidence. And they steal your confidence. If they can steal your confidence, and I'm talking to other leaders and pastors as well, if they can steal your confidence, they'll steal your anointing. And that's what the Lucifer spirit is out to do. Obviously out to rob, kill and destroy. And so with these spirits on assignment, we're going to go on and talk about the Absalom spirit, the Absalom spirit. Uh, these are spirits that we know we've got the Jezebel spirit, uh, you know, mentioned in the book of Revelation. And uh, so we need to be aware of these as people of God. And as I said, we don't want to walk around, uh, you know, just looking for false spirits and spirits on assignment. We want to be looking to Jesus, the author and the perfecter, but we don't want to be ignorant of the devil and his devices. So I hope you enjoyed session two. We're moving on to the absolute spirit in session three.